Karma. Hello. This is Ulkin E on Kazakh TV channel and I am Ainura Sanbirda. I will be hosting this program. And what about pregnant women? It's dangerous. Our second child was delivered in emergency surgery. There were one or two pregnant women in one unit. Psychosomatics can boost your immunity. Don't forget about having a good rest. One of the symptoms of the disease damage to the vascular system. I now will tell you about proper nutrition in the program. There is no doubt that the spread of a global infection, the name of which is known to every single human being on Earth, is causing a great deal of suffering. Pregnant women and newborns are among those who are being affected by the coronavirus and associated quarantine restrictions. It happens that a pregnant woman's body becomes weaker, so she can easily get infected, and this can present challenges for successful treatment. Pregnant women cannot take strong antiviral and antibacterial drugs, so the topic we will be discussing today is how do we take care of a mother and her child's health? During the pandemic, we witnessed a new infection emerging, and it had its own complications and developments. So we had a post organized, because it was necessary for pregnant women to undergo a preliminary examination before they were getting admitted. At that post, the woman's body temperature was being measured and pregnant women were also checked for coronavirus infection. They were also checked for signs of emergency admission. And if there were any such signs, they would be rushed to emergency room. We also have a special section within our department. There we admit pregnant women with suspected acute respiratory infections and women that were diagnosed with acute bronchitis as well as acute tonsillitis. These patients are usually admitted to a special section. Also, all of them wear masks, of course. To observe the social distancing rule, we would only admit one or two pregnant women per ward. In the case of general surgeries indicators, we have a special unit for that. There we have all needed facilities for surgery and, of course, all needed facilities for children delivery. There is the equipment and everything that can possibly be necessary. If those women who came during the emergency delivery were not admitted to the general section, we would transfer them to a special department. And there we have an obstetrician, a doctor in case of surgeries, there is an anesthesiologist, as well as a pediatric neonatologist who would attend to a woman and would not leave until she gave birth. After delivery, it's obligatory that we do a chest X-ray. For some women, X-rays were made only if there were any suspicions. We would then have those women examined by doctors and specialists. For example, a pulmonologist must require a sputum test for a doctor and a therapist should require a coronavirus test, PCR test. There were also pregnant women who gave birth when they were suffering from pneumonia. As a matter of fact, those women had a surgical baby delivery. We transferred those patients to medical institutions where COVID patients were treated. We rescued the child and the mother. Well, yes, I gave birth in this hospital, 
At the time of admission, I had pneumonia and more than 40% lung damage. Of course, I was worried about labor. I want to express my gratitude to the doctors of this hospitals, Research Center for Obstetrics, Gynecology and Perinatology. Thank you very much. Our second child was delivered in an emergency surgery. We arrived safely at home. Thank you. Please, now welcome our first guest, gynecologist of the highest category, Kamshat Nidbay Khazı. Kamshat Jangabayeva, obstetrician, gynecologist, obstetrician and gynecologist of the highest category, graduated from Tashkent Pediatric Medical Institute, General Medicine, doctor at the Ili Central District Hospital, Almaty region, over 14 years of work experience. Hello. Hey there. Kamshat Nidbay Khazı, welcome. Thank you. You all right? You're not sick, are you? I'm good, thank God. But you know, that's what we do. This is our job, to be at the forefront, you know? The epidemic is affecting not only adults, but also children. This infection can also be transmitted to newborns. What about pregnant women? How can we protect them? Unfortunately, you're right. There is a risk of transmission of the disease to both adults and children including pregnant women. Pregnant women, like all other people, should wear face masks and take all the necessary precautions, maintain social distance, wash their hands regularly, wash them with soap, ventilate the room, and consult with an obstetrician gynecologist online whenever it's possible. Is it possible to consult online? Well, as for the online consultations, there can be challenges, right? Initially, there were many pregnant women, and in the beginning we faced certain challenges indeed. But now we have explained to all mothers that we should stay at home to protect their health. We explained that these precautions reduce the risk of infection for both mother and child. So now everything is online, and now everything is much easier with the help of smartphones, WhatsApp and other messengers. Mm -hmm. And what if online consultation is not possible and you have to examine your patient offline? What are the arrangements? Well, usually there are three mandatory checkups during the pregnancy – 14 weeks, 20, 22 weeks, 28, 30 weeks. During the pandemic, we decided not to have those checkups offline. We offer online sessions to all women in 90% of cases unless there are significant complications or serious complaints. And what happens if a pregnant woman gets coronavirus? What is the treatment protocol? A symptomatic coronavirus does not require any specific medication. Obstetrician gynecologists we consult such patients online. We recommend to monitor body temperature, drink plenty of fluids, and eat nutritious food. If the body temperature rises, the coronavirus… And what if it's a severe case of corona? In severe cases, antiviral drugs are prescribed to such patients, under the supervision of a doctor, of course. The doctor should carefully monitor patient's condition, right? It is strictly prohibited to resort to self-treatment when antiviral drugs are prescribed. In your practice, has there been a pregnant woman with a coronavirus? We had such cases, yes. There were women in our maternity ward who were infected with coronavirus. Their PCR tests were positive. We had COVID-19 positive patients who gave birth to healthy babies and went home safe and sound. Mm -hmm. So, can this infection be transmitted to newborns? According to the World Health Organization, no coronavirus was detected in cervical or amniotic fluids or in breast milk. Therefore, we allow these patients to give birth naturally. Coronavirus does not cause miscarriage or fragmentation. So we recommend cesarean section only when it's medically justified, if there are complications that can affect mother or a child. So according to the WHO, COVID-19 positive women can give birth naturally. The World Health Organization says that breastfeeding is safe too, but this poses several problems 
Women should wear a protective suit, wash hands, wear a mask and goggles. Therefore, we recommend breastfeeding as much as possible. However, coronavirus can transmit from mother to her baby during breastfeeding, but not through breast milk, but through airborne droplets, there is a risk of airborne infections. Therefore, we recommend not to breastfeed for the first 14 days. Have there been such cases, you know, mother-to-child transmission? We explained to the women in the maternity ward that they should be isolated for 14 days without breastfeeding. So do they stay in the hospital or do you discharge them? They stay in the hospital. There were cases when the mother was isolated for 14 days, the child was under the care of a pediatrician. The mother was treated and then she returned home without infecting her child. But will it be possible to breastfeed after a 14-day long break? Now we teach women how to breastfeed, how to pump milk in order to save it for breastfeeding in future. Basically, there are ways to protect both mother and a child from those challenges. Yes, and if the mother decides to breastfeed her baby, we cannot prohibit this, right? Do you provide them with special clothes? You know, it can be a problem for many people, so we recommend not to breastfeed in order to ensure the safety of the child as much as possible. And if the mother is not cured of the coronavirus within 14 days, will she then stay in the hospital with her child? It is decided by the pediatrician if the child's condition is normal. If the child feels fine, if his condition is good, he then can be discharged from the hospital. However, if there are any complications, this child might be taken to intensive care unit. Sometimes, doctors can also visit their little patients at home. So basically, if there are people who can take care of the baby, yes, it's the pediatrician's job to teach the relatives how to feed the newborn artificially, and then they can take the baby home. Are you currently advocating for child planning when you speak to the public? After all, this virus is dangerous. A pregnant woman is vulnerable even when it comes to regular conditions, not to say during the pandemic. Pregnant women's body is very vulnerable. So do you speak to people about it? Are there any measures you are taking in this regard? Do you preach to people about planning babies for after the pandemic? No, this coronavirus infection is not a reason to stop trying for a baby. Many women are still afraid to make an appointment with a doctor when it's only the early stage of pregnancy, six, seven weeks. Now the situation is very complicated. Women think, whether I give birth or have an abortion, what will happen next? These are the questions these women ask us. They all are afraid of coronavirus. We have no right to tell them that. Okay, you have a coronavirus, so you need to have an abortion because her pregnancy is… And of course, it's difficult to decide to have an abortion. And this is not a reason for abortion. But as a professional, what would be your advice to young women, those who are not pregnant yet but are planning for a child? We recommend eating nutritious food, taking folic acid, vitamin D, to young mothers-to-be, to those who are planning a pregnancy. We check their blood tests. If the woman is healthy, there are no reasons for her not to plan her pregnancy. So this COVID-19 is not an obstacle. It's not an obstacle. Great! And during which period of pregnancy this coronavirus can be the most dangerous? Now it's difficult to predict whether it's dangerous in the first, second or a third trimester. Because the way the virus affects every single person is different. It entirely depends on every single organism individually. For some, it can be a walk in the park, for others it can be really severe. It also depends on the body's immune system. Do you have psychologists who work with pregnant women in your clinics? Those who work with them because those women are thinking about abortions, fearing that their children might be infected with coronavirus. They would definitely seek the advice of a psychologist. As a gynecologist, I explain all the threats this infection might pose. If there are any complications, we will pass such a patient to a psychologist. Are there many such patients? There are some. 
Indeed, the role of a psychologist is very important today. Therefore, almost all women who come to the women's counseling usually see a psychologist. Do all women who visit your clinic have to take a PCR test? We only perform PCR tests in the filter. When you come to the maternity ward and if you have prescription or a complaint, if there are certain complaints, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, some pregnant women may have asymptomatic coronavirus cases, right? So the symptoms will pass unnoticed. But will they be safe when it comes to childbirth? During childbirth, we… Okay, we got it, the child can be safe, but what happens to the mother, to her health? Well, for example, if the mother's COVID case is asymptomatic, but the PCR test is positive, she is considered infected. And this means we are supposed to follow all safety procedures when it comes to delivery. There is no 100% guarantee that the child will not be infected. But to prevent that child from becoming infected, so you will be taking precautions anyway, right? What are the possible threats? What challenges may occur when it comes to both pregnant women and their newborns? I can't say that there can be many complications. Hospitals have all the necessary antiviral drugs. There is an opportunity to take the PCR test. We have enough personal protective equipment and masks, so there shouldn't be any medical issues, you know? For example, after giving birth, women are transferred to a special ward. And they can be more than one woman per ward. It seems that several women can sleep in the same room. Isn't that dangerous? Don't you need to separate them? If their PCR results are positive, those patients will be isolated in the special section. And if the PCR result is negative, they will stay and sleep with other women in ordinary wards. Great. Thank you very much for your information. Good luck to you. Thank you. Goodbye. Many people, including pregnant women, are panicking because of the pandemic. And this should not happen, you know? After all, pregnant women, mothers-to-be, they already have their own hormonal issues. So their fears can only intensify. And those fears, they can be translated, transmitted to a child. I am pregnant now, and being a psychosomatics specialist, I always tell other pregnant women, please, don't panic. It's very important for a woman to be mindful when she's preparing for a childbirth. She should have this positive mindset, you know, to think about her future child in a positive manner, as this will make him healthy. So there shouldn't be any negative thoughts, panic attacks, fears or anxieties. It's very important to take long walks, to watch movies you like, to sing to your child, to things you enjoy the most. Some women like cooking, sewing, baking, knitting, and so on. Every time you panic, this panic is passed to your unborn child. And this can lead to negative consequences in the future. When your child will grow, learn, and develop, you know? For example, it's believed that if you had your panic attacks one month into pregnancy, if you had any negative thoughts, this will reflect in your child when he will be one year old. I always say this to women. Every single emotion you have during your pregnancy, every single fear, anxiety, negative thought, things you think about, good or bad, all this can be passed on to the baby. It's possible to boost immunity with psychosomatics techniques. This includes exercising, doing sports. This includes proper nutrition. Of course, if you do not eat properly, do not take care of yourself and your health, you will be more susceptible to all kinds of diseases. Therefore, you need to take care of yourself first, because you don't want to get sick. And this includes taking vitamins. Along with psychosomatics, if you want your child to live a healthy life, you need to pay more attention to your healthy lifestyle. You also need to pay attention to the health of your children. 
proper nutrition, long walks. When I'm sick, I usually feel taken care of. Parents would treat me well, give me medicines, take my temperature, pay me a lot of attention, talk to me a lot, bring me water, look after me and caress me. We would go outside, they would read me tales aloud, sit next to me until I fall asleep. Basically, it is vital that any woman who is planning her pregnancy takes great care of her own health. This includes her emotional well-being too. She should pay attention to her mood, all those external stress factors, you know, negative conversations, conversations that can cause panic attacks is especially relevant during the pandemic. All of this can negatively affect the child inside. Therefore, one should not pay attention to every single rumor or hearsay, every external stress factor. Pregnant women should not be pessimistic. The psychosomatics of the virus are very basic. If you are pessimistic, if you give in to the danger, to the anger, if you give in to fear, the virus can defeat you. So even in case you have possibly got infected, you shouldn't be panicking. Just be positive. Don't be afraid of anything. Take care of your health take care of your child's health and try to change the perspective. Mood is all about perspective. For example, being outside and walking, it can subside panic attacks, making you more focused. And if your child is infected with the Kawasaki virus, pay attention to every motion of your child, take care of your child, show your child your love, pamper him, send him your positive energy and vibes. It will make him feel good, and it will make you feel good too. This way you will be able to overcome the virus psychosomatically, if only you try to get rid of the bad emotions in the child, and pay him as much attention as possible. And now our next guest. Please welcome Talshin Artıkızı, blogger and nutritionist. Welcome. Thank you. Talshin Artıkızı, blogger, nutritionist, dietitian. Al Farabi Kazakh National University, bachelor and master degrees in biomedicine, physiology, and biophysics. Graduated from the Perfect Life online course by Kazakh Academy of Nutrition and from the Preventich Russian Institute. Talshin, I see that you're pregnant. How many months? Mm -hmm. I'm seven months into pregnancy. Seven months. We are feeling great. Amazing. As a nutritionist, you know better than anyone the consequences of anemia. You organized online marathons on this topic. Can we say that anemia can make a person more susceptible to the virus? Of course it does. Absolutely. This is because what we call anemia is the complete lack of oxygen in the body. Physiologically, it's very dangerous for both mother and unborn child. Basically, in the first trimester of pregnancy, the general hormonal background changes and the body starts to adapt to new dweller, because initially this baby is considered a stranger. That is when the pregnant woman's immune system goes down, and then so it weakens. Yes, it weakens, and if this pregnant woman has anemia, then each of her body cells lacks oxygen, and even the child can feel this oxygen deficiency, so their conditions can worsen. This can lead to hypoxia. Yes, it can lead to hypoxia, and it also can lead to various neurological disorders. What should a pregnant woman do if she has anemia? First of all, this pregnant woman should be under constant medical supervision. Secondly, she needs to eat properly. 
And if she has mineral deficiencies, she should take supplements, vitamins and minerals. All of this should be done under the supervision of a doctor. Of course, absolutely, there shouldn't be any cases of self-treatment. What advice would you give as a nutritionist? As a nutritionist, I would say the following. Remember about the nutrients. Nutrients are divided in two groups. The first group is our basic nutrients, carbohydrates, proteins and fats. They are fully available in our everyday food. The second group is vitamins and macronutrients. In the first trimester, folic acid, B-group vitamins and others should be taken regularly. As a part of the future, mom's diet. And in what food B-group vitamins can be found? Well, first of all, B-group vitamins can be found in the animal protein, that is, red meat, especially beef, it has a lot of protein, and those proteins help with anemia. Red meat is rich in amino acids. We must also eat vegetables and fruits. Can women who got infected with the coronavirus during pregnancy give birth on their own? Of course, they can give birth naturally. It happens in our country all the time. You see, it all depends on the immune system. If the immune system is strong, everything will be fine. Also, it's important for women to be in a good mood, to always have this connection with her child. It's necessary to understand the child. Then everything will be fine. You're now pregnant too. Did you have any fears? There were some fears, of course, but now I'm fine. This is my third child, so I didn't worry too much. The main thing is the perception. It's all in our heads. Everything will be great if we rewire our brain and if we eat properly and take our vitamins. After all, mother's mood is directly related to the child's well-being. In general, there are a lot of rumors that salmal is good, kumus is good and horse meat is good. As an expert, what can you say about it? I would agree with kumus and salmal, because they contain a lot of amino acids. They're also rich in vitamins B, A, P, P and C. Especially kumus. It contains a lot of vitamin C. And it's well known that vitamin C can help increase our body's ability to fight viruses and bacteria. As for how to take those beverages, I believe it's better to drink kumas an hour after meal. It will be more digestible. Also, it's better to drink salmal on an empty stomach. It can be a good idea to drink it up to five times a day. And it's better not to eat after taking salmal, so that it can be fully absorbed. And the course is, so for how long should I take these beverages? You can have a full course of these beverages, sometimes between two weeks and a month. You can eat only after an hour and a half or two. In general, pregnant women can drink salmal. Yes, absolutely. You can also drink kumus. You can drink kumus, but the daily dose should not exceed 200 millimeters. So salmal can be drunk up to five times per day, and only 200 milligrams of kumus are allowed. Yes, if mother-to-be, you know, some future mothers may have high blood pressure, so if mother's-to-be has blood pressure issues, whether it's high or low, in such cases kumu should be taken with precautions. It's better not to drink it at all, if you feel dizzy or feel like throwing up. These days, most of us have started to eat more meat, thinking that lamb and horse meat are good for our health. How right or wrong is that? In general, I do not recommend lamp meat in case of anemia or high blood pressure. As for beef, it's more useful when it comes to anemia. As for the lamp, fat tail grease, it can help us fight the epidemic, but should also be properly prepared and used in accordance with certain standards. So how much of it can be used on average? On average, no more than 70 grams per day. Should I drink it in liquid form? Not necessarily in a liquid state. For example, we say that we can prepare it ourselves, saying that just a small teaspoon is enough one day on an empty stomach, on an empty stomach, but you can take it with food too. What vitamins are needed for pregnant women to give birth to a healthy offspring? First of all, of course you need folic acid, you need B vitamins. If necessary, you can take a mineral complex, especially minerals like calcium, magnesium and zinc. Those should be taken under doctor's supervision, right? Only on the advice of a doctor. This is because excessive vitamin consumption or hypovitaminosis is more dangerous for the body than vitamin deficiency, because it can lead to the intoxication of the body if there is an excess of vitamins in our system. Therefore, pregnancy should be supervised by a physician and a nutritionist. You have just mentioned vitamins. So what is considered a safe dose 
for a healthy person. The amount of essential vitamins per day. You mean daily intake, right? Well, let's start with vitamin C. From 70 to 100 grams for children. As for the adults, over the course of a day, they can take up to 500 grams. This information is provided on the package of the vitamins that we take. Do not take more than that. Also, we need to remember that vitamin C is quickly excreted through the skin or with urine almost immediately after ingestion. Therefore, it's better to opt for a digestible type of vitamin C. Everyone is saying that it's important to eat properly during this epidemic. As a specialist, as a nutritionist, do you see any increase in the number of people who come to you? I can say that the number of patients has increased a lot. Especially recently I have been conducting webinars and online marathons related to anemia. Unfortunately, anemia is now more common in children, pregnant women and breastfeeding mothers. Why? Doesn't have to do anything with the environment? It depends on the environment, of course, and even during this quarantine, we do not go out as much, we do not go out to walk and breathe the fresh air. For example, children are stuck in their houses where they lack oxygen, there is no fresh air, and it affects people. Also, cases of malnutrition have increased. Unfortunately, it's true, I did some research on this. And you know, it turned out that when the city was closed for quarantine, malnutrition among Kazakhstan residents increased. This is because when we go to the store, we usually buy fizzy drinks, crisps, chocolates and so on, and we are not that willing to buy useful things. Therefore, I would like to say that proper nutrition should be a matter of primary importance during quarantine. As Kazakhs say, sick because of food. Exactly. So you can say the proper nutrition can prevent a lot of problems. We have a Kazakh proverb saying that if you want to be healthy, keep your mouth shut. Therefore, I think that if every citizen will adhere to this, everything will be fine. It seems that there is this misconception when people hear they need to eat properly, they think they need to eat a lot. Absolutely. So were there any women who approached you with such complaints? For example, that they ate too much, gained weight? Yes, of course. There were a lot of such complaints during quarantine, especially for breastfeeding mothers. But I can say that it's usually caused by hormones, because during quarantine we often stay at home and we are stressed. And we have this wonderful stress hormone called cortisol. Excess cortisol affects the entire endocrine system. That's why we start overeating. As a result of this stress, for a healthy person the total daily intake should not exceed 1500 to 1000 calories. This is more than enough. In order to have normal levels of cortisol, it's important to have a proper night's sleep, right? If you can please elaborate on this a bit more. Proper sleeping patterns are important. All people should fall asleep between 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. It's not a good idea to watch TV or scroll your smartphone 30-40 minutes before bedtime. This will cause fatigue. We have this wonderful substance called melanin. This hormone is released only before 1 a.m. If you don't get to bed before 1 a.m., you won't get any quality sleep at all. This hormone can help with inflammation. If there is already inflammation in the body, it can lead to an increase in stress and a decrease in the immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, what exercises should women do in order to regulate hormones in general? First of all, exercise our brains. We call it meditation. Everything is related to our mood. As women, we are very emotionally driven. If we keep those emotions at bay, not let them overwhelm us, Everything will be fine. That's the first thing I would say. And now mood? The mood is important, of course. And what about physical exercises? Physical exercises, of course, you can do morning exercises. You can walk in the fresh air in the morning now. I found out that 90% of my female patients have stress-related hormonal disorders. We have an exercise video featuring you. Let's take a look at it, and after that we will have another great specialist coming to our studio. Good afternoon, friends. Not only proper nutrition, but also physical activity is important for pregnant women's immune system, because physical activity is very good for your health and for your unborn baby. Due to the long duration of the pandemic, pregnant women, unfortunately, spent a lot of time inside at home. 
The gyms were closed. However, I urge you to go out in the fresh air and do various physical exercises for your health and normal development of the child. It will be very good for you and your baby's immune system. First of all, we will start our training with a warm-up. Please stand with your feet shoulder width apart. And then we will start with our arms. You need to breathe properly during these exercises. We will inhale and exhale through our nose and mouth. That is, we breathe through the nose and exhale through the mouth. This will increase oxygen supply to your baby. And you too will feel very comfortable breathing this way. Our next exercise is a mass do for your child because we will do something that the baby will like a lot. We will twirl around. Don't forget to breathe. Other side. We will use this ball for our next exercise. This ball is something I believe anyone should have, whether during the pregnancy or after it, because you know how important it is to have a proper recovery after giving birth. This ball is also very convenient for baby massage. Right now we sit on the ball, sit comfortably, spread our legs and turn from right to left. This exercise will help your pelvis to open properly and prepare your muscles for contractions. If you do this exercise during labor, it will be very useful for both the baby and you. Let's get started. And let's not forget to breathe. Other side. We will use the ball again for our next exercise. In this exercise, our muscles will be fully stretched. Stretching is important. It's very useful exercise for your child. And here I need to mention, I exercise regularly, so my body is completely ready for this kind of activity. If you are not in good shape and your child is very active, stop doing this exercise immediately. So, let's go! For the next exercise, make yourself comfortable. Place your hand under your head. Your second hand, you can either place it here or you can hold your belly. Right now we're going to exercise our leg muscles. You might have noticed that after the second trimester, many women experience leg cramps and swelling. This exercise will help you in these situations. Let's start. The global coronavirus pandemic has affected pregnant women in our country, too. That's why, even if you didn't have the coronavirus, it's important to eat right and exercise in the fresh air to prevent it. Go out more often, eat healthy, and never forget to exercise. Raushan Yespaeva, obstetrician and gynecologist of the highest category, candidate of medical sciences, associate professor of the obstetrics and gynecology department, Kazakh University of Continuous Education. Dear viewers, please welcome our next guest, Raushan Nurkadir Kaza, doctor of the highest category, obstetrician gynecologist. Welcome. Hello. 
How the pandemic affected the situation in maternity hospitals. Of course, the situation has changed dramatically. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have completely stopped the practice of birth support partners in our maternity hospitals. In the past, it was a very common practice. And now we don't do that anymore. The reason for this is to prevent the spread of the infection. The same was done to prevent it. Pregnant women must take a PCR test before getting admitted to the maternity hospital, so the choice of the maternity hospital will depend on the results of this PCR test. If the PCR test is positive, the woman goes to a special maternity hospital to give birth. And if this test is negative and the woman is not sick, she can go to the usual maternity hospital. Are there any cases of COVID-19 in maternity hospitals? Of course, there are such cases. There are a lot of coronavirus-positive patients in those special maternity hospitals. Why does it happen? Unfortunately, pregnant women suffer from this COVID-19 too. They can get infected. Most of them have asymptomatic cases of coronavirus. It's mandatory for such women to be admitted to special maternity hospitals in order to give birth. And if they get sick during pregnancy, then they are admitted into the infectious diseases hospitals. Or they go to those special COVID-19 hospitals for treatment. For example, if a pregnant woman has a severe case of infection, will this woman give birth naturally or will she have a cesarean section? Well, this is not just about COVID-19. The main factor here is the extent of lung damage. Also, we examine these patients for respiratory failures, depending on the degree of their oxygen deficiency. Then it also depends on the obstetric situation. It depends on whether there are any complications in obstetrics. The severe form of COVID alone is not justification for cesarean section. I would like to ask a question to a specialist. My first question is, for example, I usually don't give birth between the 40th and 42nd week. I usually give birth at week 37, 38. What do I do if I do not have time to take the PCR test? Great question. Yes, that happens often. So, I won't be able to go to the maternity hospital of my choice, right? What will happen? You're right. This is because the test is valid for five to seven days. That's why we test pregnant women only when they're about to give birth. If so, can I then get tested at week 36? Get tested in advance. Because during my two previous pregnancies, I gave birth at week 37 and then at week 38. And now my doctor says that he will get me tested at week 38. So the thing is that in case you give birth earlier in your previous pregnancies, then you should be ready to submit your PCR test earlier, right? If your result will expire, you will have to retake the test. And if, for example, the PCR is not ready and your contractions begin, the water breaks, and you don't have symptoms of COVID-19, then you will go to the maternity hospital of your choice but you will need to do an express test upon admission. That express test? So is there such a thing as an express test? Of course there is. Well, then I'm not worried at all. Depending on the results of the express tests, we will see what to do further. If your express test is positive, you will need to take a PCR test. And if the PCR test is positive too, you will be placed in a separate ward. Because you can't have any interactions with other healthy women, you will need to be isolated. Raushan Nurqadr Qazza, in your experience, were there any women who had this disease and gave birth prematurely? Yes, there were such cases. Of course, there were such women. How dangerous is it for the child and for the mother? First of all, premature birth is dangerous for the baby in the first place, because he was born prematurely. And it depends on the gestation period. In fact, at 34 weeks of gestation, the baby's lungs are mature. If delivery occurs after 34 weeks, the lungs are considered mature. Respiratory failure is very rare in such children. They will often not get sick. They will have a high viability. Mm -hmm. And if the mother gives birth before 34 weeks, then these children will have difficulty breathing on their own with their own lungs. They will usually end up in an intensive care. They will be given oxygen through a machine or respirator, depending on the duration of pregnancy. 
Raushan Nurkadar Khaza, I want to ask you as a specialist. You know, many pregnant women write to me on Instagram. They complain about this online examinations. They say they don't see their doctors as often as they used to before. You know, in the past, I used to go to a specialist every month during my previous pregnancy. I was checked thoroughly. If necessary, additional tests were performed, you know? Now everything is online, so according to statistics, did this transition to online sessions in some way affected the well-being of mothers and fathers? But there was no difference at all. What changes are taking place now? Has there been any changes, for example? There were no serious changes. This is because checklists were distributed among pregnant women. Those pregnant women monitor their condition according to these checklists. If a pregnant woman has some kind of condition, she must first consult her doctor. Then she must write about her condition in this checklist. This is how she monitors her own condition. Do you have a headache? Has your vision deteriorated or not? And so on. You know, before, when we were pregnant, Doctors would monitor our health, measure our bellies, monitor our weight gain. So we would always have this physical connection. What's happening now? Doctors used to check up on us, check our baby's heartbeat. So how can this be performed now? I'm just curious. We teach pregnant women how to take care of themselves. That's what we do under normal circumstances. And now when the things are out of the ordinary, the most important thing is to count baby movements from the 20th week. There are special techniques for teaching how to count those movements. If everything is normal for this baby, then everything is fine for the baby. Then it's also important to assess your uterine tone, to teach women about the scale of uterine tone. So the full responsibility is now on the woman herself, right? No, the full responsibility is equally divided between the woman and the doctor. In case there are any abnormalities, you should contact your doctor immediately. In case of emergency, pregnant women must call an ambulance. Some women do not register with the women's counseling on time. They don't show up for their appointments. It's important for every doctor to know such women. They must be watched. They must be invited for the appointments. They must know how to use those checklists. The doctors should share their contact details and means of communication. The midwife should provide her contact details too. If such women don't get in touch for too long, the doctor and the midwife should call them or text them on WhatsApp. And what if this woman doesn't have access to internet? I think these days every single person has WhatsApp. I have one more question. You know, many women write to me. They often say that depression and panic attacks among pregnant women have doubled because of quarantine stress. For example, there is a psychologist in the polyclinic I am registered with. She constantly calls me and monitors my psychological well-being. Do you practice this too? Have you ever had a case of sending a woman to a psychologist? Yes, I often advise women to go to see a psychologist because it can be possible that she experienced painful things during her previous pregnancies. For example, things like preeclampsia, high blood pressure or other complications, possibly the loss of a baby and so on. If there were any such complications and difficulties that affected her psyche, then I'm obliged to advise this pregnant woman to see a psychologist. You're right, some pregnant women often have panic attacks. This is true. It's very common these days. I guess the quarantine must have intensified the problem. Women with second to third pregnancies are less likely to have panic attacks because during previous pregnancies they often consulted a doctor at their private sessions. And this helps them today. It does, because you know, they have already been taught how to fill the checklist. They know how to call and when, under which conditions. However, they might still be worried because they do not see their doctors offline and they can have a proper conversation with their doctor. They might be stressed out because of overthinking. I feel like they might need help. They want to see their doctors offline. Yes, they want to see them face to face. They want to talk to have their bellies measured. They want their doctors to monitor their weight and blood pressure. They want some advice. Of course, the situation is clear. We often have blood tests made during the pregnancy. How can this be arranged today? Is it online too? No. We invite women for blood tests. 
They come, but we tell them to come at a certain time. We can't allow two women to gather at the same place and at the same time. Safe distance must be maintained, so they come specifically for the appointment. We tell them to go to the laboratory and get tested. If the blood test results are normal at the time of the first test, we recommend they come back in two or three months. And if the hemoglobin is low or one of the indicators doesn't look good, then we reroute the women to therapist and hematologist. According to the recommendations of that specialist, we will schedule the next blood test. But again, it will take place during a certain time. They will keep their distance, wear a face mask when they come to the clinic. All rules must be followed. There are also other doctors that are in charge of pregnant women's well-being. Not only obstetricians and gynecologists, but also phlebologists, endocrinologists. Does it mean their advice should also be taken online? When a pregnant woman registers for the first time, we collect her entire medical history from her. We try to find out what diseases she had in the past. Then, if it's necessary, we'll have her examined by additional specialists. But now it's up to us to decide whether we need another piece of advice. It will all depend on the woman's condition and situation. If you have no complaints and nothing to worry, then you can always talk to the specialists via WhatsApp. Talshin, and what can you tell us about your online consultations? I have a little bit of biomedical knowledge and that really helps me a lot, so I guess I feel fine, I'm good. As for my doctors, psychologists and therapists and gynecologists, I always in touch with them, but I have to go and pay for the test myself. I would like to ask, you have just mentioned this new delivery room. For example, I haven't done my cycloscopy when I needed to, so I went to the hospital and had it done there. Did it ever happen that you had patients who didn't undergo cycloscopy on time? What were the complications? To have a cycloscopy, you need to have medical justification. You must have a moderate or severe myopia. I don't think I have it. My vision is not perfect, but it's not bad either. Well, there is nothing to be afraid of. This is only a mild degree of myopia. There is no need to perform a cycloscopy. Now we do not force women during childbirth. We used to force them during childbirth before. Now the situation has changed. Now we want them to be relaxed when they give birth to a child. So now not so many women experience eye strain or lose their vision after labor. As I say, if you have moderate to high myopia, you do not necessarily need to have a cycloscopy. You do not necessarily have to give birth by cesarean section, because the labor protocols changed a lot. I remember before, during my two previous pregnancies, I attended the Young Moms Club that was launched in my local polyclinic. Young Moms Club. Yes, the Young Moms Club. You can go there with your husband. Now I'd like to tell all mothers to be that you can look those exercises up on the internet and do them at home. The key is relaxation and proper breathing. It's very important, right? For both mother and child. And now, is there any kind of special protocol for pregnant women with this disease in Kazakhstan? There is no special protocol for pregnant women in Kazakhstan. There is a general protocol. But in general, the fifth and sixth supplements of the protocol mentioned above are for pregnant women. The supplement is a part of the general protocol. Everything is explained in that protocol. Things like how to deliver children, everything is well written. Raushan, Talshan, thank you very much. Talshan, we wish you a safe labor. Please take care. I wish you both good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Dear viewers, and now let's pay attention to the video prepared by our editors. For kids, this COVID-19 thing is like a regular cold. We should wear masks outside and wash our hands once we come back home. You need to wear a mask. Use hand sanitizers. You need to wear a mask. It felt like a flu, you know? My mom anoints me with fat tail grease. She anoints my back and other body parts. You need to wear a mask. Wash your hands with soap. Coughing, loss of smell, loss of taste are common. I wore a mask. Sanitize my hands with alcohol. Coughing and taking medicines. We need to wear a face mask. She would treat me, take me to the doctor. It's important to wear a face mask and use hand sanitizers. You need to wear a mask. 
you need to wear a mask, wash your hands, and of course, don't visit people that often. Social distancing is important, and all other safety measures, of course, and one should always wear a mask. I had a stomach ache for three days. I recovered fast. Face masks should be worn at all times. It's important to wash hands. Aliya Yerinbaeva, infectious disease doctor and pediatrician of the first category, Asfindiyar of Kazakh National Medical University, 14 years of work experience. The information that our guests share with us in our program is very important. Please welcome our next guest, pediatrician Aliya Yerinbaeva. Aliya, welcome to our studio. Thank you. Aliya Yerinbaeva, this COVID-19 epidemic has worried all of us. Mothers with children are especially worried these days, to be honest. There are a lot of rumors about Kawasaki syndrome in the country. What do you have to say to this? Kawasaki syndrome is one of the rarest and most severe syndromes. Kawasaki syndrome is one of the most common syndromes of damage to the multifactorial vascular system. But it's not a COVID-19. No, it's not a COVID-19, but they are related. How dangerous is it? It is dangerous. It is something similar to a heart attack or a stroke. Aneurysms are thinning and stretching blood vessels. This can result in blood vessel rupture. The lethality of the syndrome is very high. Therefore, I believe it's not Kawasaki syndrome. It's one of the Kawasaki-like syndromes. The syndrome consists of several symptoms – fever, enlarged lymphatic nodules, as well as rash, dry lips, dry fingers, and skin peeling. So the skin can start peeling. It's a sign of compromised immune system. Is it contagious? It is contagious. Is it dangerous to go to the kindergarten together with a kid who suffers from this infection? It's not dangerous to go to kindergarten together. Look, this Kawasaki syndrome is a compilation that occurs as a result of various diseases. It can occur after a common cold, streptococcal or bacterial infections. Staphylococcus, streptococcus. If the immune response was not strong enough, this might happen. This leads to Kawasaki syndrome. It can prolong the course of the disease. Children of what age are most susceptible to this disease, which is similar to Kawasaki syndrome? At what age do children get sick? Children between the ages of 2 and 8 can suffer from the Kawasaki-like syndrome. And what is the treatment? The treatment is usually symptomatic. If the throat is swollen and red, we rinse the throat with antiseptic solutions, anoint lip cracks with e-vitamin. We administer eye drops if the eyes are red. More precisely, there is no specific treatment. Mm -hmm. The last resort would be IV fluids. But we do this only when child is very weak. We do this at the hospital. What about children suffering from COVID-19? How do their bodies deal with this complication? You know, children usually have only mild symptoms. And are there any little patients suffering from severe forms of the disease? I didn't have such cases in my practice. I have only seen children with mild symptoms. What about the teenagers? Do they get sick? Are they considered adults after they turn 14? Are they still considered children? So far, it's very difficult to say whether teenagers get sick easily or severely. It entirely depends on the background pathologies. Of course, as it can affect the blood system or nervous system. The burden of disease then becomes more complicated. Whether they have a severe or mild form entirely depends on the strength of their immune system. Children with COVID-19 may develop Kawasaki syndrome, right? Yes, it's possible. It happens when our immune system fails and doesn't respond properly. For example, after streptococcus infection. Meaning that if a child suffers from COVID-19, it's possible that he can get Kawasaki too. It's possible. It can happen as a result of tonsillitis, angina, bronchitis, pneumonia, streptococcus, staphylococcus, after bacterial infection. All of these diseases can lead to Kawasaki-like syndrome.
Alia Yerenbay Kaza, thank you so much for your answers. We wish you good luck. Thank you. And that is all for today, dear viewers. I will see you again next time on our Ulkenu program.